All right, now we're joined by Mike Diaz, who's running for Superior Court position 38. Just go ahead with a two minute introduction. Great, thanks. First, thanks everybody for having me again. Uh, my name is Mike Diaz. Uh, I was appointed last month, uh, actually not last month, uh, late last year, to be a King County Superior Court judge by Governor Inslee. Uh, I'm running to retain my seat. Uh, I don't have the challenge at this time, uh, but I'm looking forward to chatting with you a little bit today. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my family and I immigrated uh, when I was an infant uh, to Seattle. Uh, landed first actually in Ballard, uh, so in your district. Uh, and then when I was in junior high, we moved down um, to White Center, uh, where I grew up. My dad, uh, he was raised with his six siblings uh, in the slums of Lima, Peru. Um, and uh, by a single teenage mom, my, my grandma. Uh, and when he got here, he washed dishes, uh, cleaned some of the buildings I worked in in downtown. I can honestly say that my family and I have lived a version of the immigrant's American dream. Uh, for me, part of that dream uh, isn't just working hard and uh, having professional success, but having a chance to give back to your community. And I was lucky enough to be able to serve my community and literally represent the United States in federal court uh, as a civil rights lawyer for the U.S. Attorney's Office here in, here in Seattle. Uh, in my decade there, I founded the Civil Rights Unit uh, and started the reforms of the Seattle Police Department through the consent decree. Um, through that work, uh, I think I gave others uh, who came behind me uh, the opportunity to live, work, and be free from discrimination, take advantage of some, some of the opportunities I had. Um, and so now that I'm on the bench, uh, I continue to be passionately committed to equal access to justice. I want my court to be a place that is open to all, uh, for all, no matter your gender, race, ethnicity, uh, and uh, I want to do so efficiently. So I'm trying to work on making the court as efficient as possible. Um, so in short, a court open to all, uh, and without wasting anyone's time. That will give people the opportunity to take advantage of those opportunities in the justice system uh, that I enjoyed uh, as a lawyer. So with that, I'd love to get to your questions. Great, thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions that we're asking all candidates for Superior Court, and they're in front of you. I'd like to turn that over so you yep. can read along as we read them aloud. Great. So two-minute answers, and Ben, would you do number one? What barriers to access are there in courts for unrepresented litigants, people with disabilities, and other vulnerable populations? And what steps have you taken to promote access to justice? Yeah, um, it's a great question. It's a question, one that I actually dedicated a lot of my professional life to uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, there are at least three levels of uh, barriers to access, at least in the criminal justice system. Um, they're enjoying my answer, I think. <laughs> um, the first, it begins way before you get into the court. It's with the, with the police. And uh, like I said, I, I started the reforms of the Seattle Police Department by investigating, negotiating, and then implementing the consent decree. Uh, in that case, uh, I began dialogue that had been uh, resting for a long time. Uh, we started that two years, three years before Ferguson and Baltimore and Chicago and those things, uh, to have those conversations with the police. Uh, second, uh, we did, we had a case involving some courts up in Mount Vernon uh, where the Folks, indigent folks up there weren't receiving adequate uh, and competent counsel. And we filed a statement of interest, which uh, National NPR covered and said it was an unprecedented statement of interest uh, to really provide technical assistance on how they can provide uh, competent counsel to people who don't have the money up there. Uh, and then finally, I actually had an investigation involving the court that I currently sit on. Um, we, got a, we had a case where a man from Russia uh, wasn't provided interpreter services in a very important civil case. Civil cases can be you know, anything from landlord-tenant cases uh, to cases where your kids are being taken away from you. Uh, and there wasn't a guarantee at the time that you were gonna get an interpreter. Uh, we investigated and reached a very good agreement uh, with those folks, uh, with that court, my current court, uh, to provide interpreter services regardless of uh, the type of case and free of charge. Uh, I think I opened up, helped open up the court in that way. That work then expanded statewide uh, and uh, I worked with Justice Gonzalez who we're gonna meet with soon. And uh, there is now uh, rules requiring that around the state. Uh, I, like I said, keep an open court in all these ways in my own life. Great, Jason, number two. Uh, <clears throat> what state or federal, uh, federal uh, Supreme Court decision do you disagree with the most? Yep. Um, you know, there are, as you know, there are limitations on what judges can talk about, particularly um, uh, cases that might come in front of them, or whether that's an inter interpretation of the Supreme Court. But I think I'm pretty comfortable uh, pointing to some historical decisions that I disagree with uh, at, the, at the U.S. Supreme Court 
different level. And then I think every, almost everybody disagreed with these days, such as Plessy v. Ferguson, which uh, found that uh, you know, separate but equal was okay. Um, other Supreme Court cases around that same time period, which found that um, that uh, African Americans were you know, justifiably three fifths of a human being under the law. Um, you know, in my cases, like I mentioned, the, the interpreter case, um, I actually. Uh, work hard in my courtroom to ensure that whether you come from the fanciest firms in town or really around the nation, uh, or you are a pro se litigant or one represented by a pro bono counsel, that you're going to be treated with dignity uh, and you're going to be heard and you're going to have your chance in court. Um, that comes both not only from my civil rights work, but also from my values. Um, growing up, uh, public service uh, was uh, ingrained in us. Um, to, not just uh, take advantage of all the opportunity, economic opportunities you have being in this country, but actually uh, giving back and making sure that the next generation of immigrants, you know, whether that's uh, East Africans, whether that's Muslims, whether that's um, Haitians, all have the same opportunities we have. And that means uh, going so far as not just repudiating those Supreme Court cases that have been overturned, but then um, seeing how else we can improve access to the courts, um, obviously, considering someone who's subhuman is not uh, an artifact or human that we should uh, repudiate. Uh, Sophia number three. Please describe your beliefs around the concept of restorative justice and whether you see a potential for judicial action from the bench as influential on that process. Yeah. So restorative justice is actually um, super interesting. One of the um, founders locally, Andrew Brennicke, uh, who led up the initial office in the city of Seattle, uh, is a friend. Uh, we worked on a civil rights case together, um, actually. And it's, it is, a, I'd say it's a developing area. Um, it, it holds great opportunity uh, in the right kind of cases uh, for the right kinds of defendants. Um, particularly, we've seen success uh, I've read about it. I, I've never participated in it directly myself. Um, part of the Seattle Police Consent Decree was to encourage these kinds of innovations, uh, which then they took advantage of, but I didn't myself participate in these. But what I've read publicly, is publicly available, is that they've had good success, particularly with juveniles, um, particularly in peer settings. Um, one of my uh, colleagues on the municipal court bench can talk about it more, but they actually seen when they bring kids in, whether it's on a traffic dispute or something more serious, uh, that the influence that those types of peers can have in explaining the harm that was done in that kind of case uh, can actually begin to turn uh, the kid around uh, using you know, non-punitive things. Um, from In terms of uh, potential for judicial action from the bench, I will say we, I think in my three or four months being on the bench, um, uh, I've seen uh, that I think that we're pretty lucky to have a bench that is very forward-looking, that is very open to a lot of changes uh, in how they uh, proceed. Um, they've, my bench has, has um, you know, IT, uh, involuntary treatment at court for folks who are su uh, suffering with uh, behavioral health issues. Um, we have lots of different kind of courts. We have lots of different types of options, and we have a King County prosecutor who uh, generally is also willing to engage in these types of discussions. Done so even in the face of some uh, some challenges in the restorative justice process. Please share an incident or aspect of your work history that has changed or enhanced your interpretation of the law. Yeah, um, that's a very good question as well. Um, you know, the one thing that people think I think is that. Um, the law is you can just crack open a book and that's where the law is the judge just basically has to read from the book um, and uh, it's actually a lot harder than that it's um, there's a lot of gray areas in the law and there's a lot when new laws come out and you can read about them in, with any new law that comes out of paper there has to be one of the judicial roles is interpreting for the parties what they understand the law to mean um, there are a lot of rules on how to interpret laws um, and their guidelines but it is a challenge, I think, for a lot of new judges. Uh, one of the benefits of the work I did as a civil rights lawyer uh, for 10 years is that I got to work not just on the classic 1960s, 70s civil rights cases like housing discrimination, educational discrimination, employment discrimination, but 
also the newer laws, and I mentioned the police case already, but also the ADA, which is a recent law, 25 years, uh, which isn't very far in terms of some of these laws. Um, and uh, one of the cases I'm proud of too are the service members' rights cases. So the, the Department of Justice enforces rights that our service members have. Some of these laws are less than five years old, at least when I was doing them. And so uh, I was able to uh, two or three times uh, take cases where we wanted to make good law for these service members. Whether that's a housing case where they were blatantly discriminated against because they happened to be uh, serving their country. Uh, or it's an employment case where they didn't get their job back in the way they were supposed to. I got a chance to follow these rules of what is called statutory interpretation and see, okay, how am I going to interpret this law? Um, and, uh, and it was a learning experience, uh, but it's also something that uh, at some point as a, now as a sitting judge, I'll get to be able to do um, a little bit with that experience. So uh, it really enhanced my, uh, my experience and it was fun too. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. You can ask whatever they want. And we'll start with David. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask a question that you won't be able to answer in a minute. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm intrigued by your family story. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I'm a grandchild of immigrants yeah. uh, who escaped from Europe. Yeah. And uh, you're a son of an immigrant who escaped from Peru. I'm an immigrant myself. I you came over as an as infant. A kid. Yeah. yeah, right. Uh, and so I'm just wondering um, uh, uh, what, how your dad had the courage to come. Yeah. And yeah. how he had the wherewithal to raise his yeah. family, yeah. Uh, get you through law school. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. there must have been a lot of things that happened yeah. on that yeah. path. I just share no, some I of them with thing. us. Yeah, I could talk about this all day, literally. My dad, uh, he's just an amazing guy. Um, just to layer on some details. You know, he, when, if, if you've ever seen um, City of God or Slumdog Millionaire, I mean, that's how my dad grew up, in, in an adobe hut. He didn't own a pair of shoes until he was seven, uh, or nine. He, he started working when he was seven, following his mom along. He was, again, a teenage mom, my grandma, uh, along the streets of selling, you know, fried dough or you know, knickknacks. Um, and uh, it was a hard life. And, uh, you know, he, I, I tell the story about you know, there was a time when my grandma, all too, was also she was what we would call now a victim of domestic violence, right? And um, and she, my dad remembers fleeing that mud hut to a cave up in the hills, in the desert hills of Lima, Peru, um, and and what that challenge is like. And, and I think what what it taught me is that just the strength that he had. Um, you know, if you can overcome that stuff, you get here washing dishes isn't that hard. It's actually a privilege. Uh, and you also find the most patriotic people who appreciate a country who come here and. Uh, gives them opportunity at least to wash dishes. And we ran out of time. <laughs> uh, do you agree with many community and faith leaders that the new youth jail being built in Seattle not only sends the wrong message to our community, but is a waste of our money when compared to the dramatically lower cost of renovating the current facility and how the money might otherwise be spent for the benefit of the community? Yeah. Um, here, uh, just two, two quick answers. One, um, you know, this case might be one that gets litigated. I can see civil rights issues being involved here, right? I can see ADA issues being, and Americans with Disabilities Act issues being raised here. Um, and so I'm loath to comment specifically on this. Second, so these are, a lot of these things are policy issues. Um, and one of the canons of judicial ethics, and I believe in this, is that you have to have somebody, folks can duke it out in the legislatures, folks can duke it out to become an executive, but you have to have folks who are independent, and neutral, and are credible. I believe in the trial courts, and I want to be a trial court judge because that's what the rule of law is, where you can go somewhere uh, and that they're just not uh, beholden to one side or the other. That said, it's a complicated issue, um, and I think King County, uh, obviously I'm supportive of Marin County, has done a lot already to reduce the rate of youth incarceration uh, greatly. Um, I know some of the judges who do this work, uh, and I know that that's what they're after as well. And um, I'm sorry, with that, with a big long run up, I wasn't able to answer. Questions, Nicole. Uh, what do you do in your court to help promote victim safety? That's a great question. Uh, a couple things. One, it's just like with the defendant, just like with the state, it's important to hear all perspectives. Um, so a lot of judges, not as many in King County, but in other places, uh, don't make enough time to hear victims out. Um, and 
And so whether it's at sentencing or whether it's a review hearing where we're gonna modify the sentence uh, or whether it's a restitution where a victim is asking for their money back if they got ripped off or something like that, I always make sure and I try to be very respectful that they have a, a chance to be heard, right? So if there is a safety issue, they're gonna raise it um, and, uh, and, uh, and then we'll resolve that then. Um, I mean, I, I guess other things are that, um, you know, the county, and again, I'm running out of time here, um, is very proactive in finding ways to reduce incarceration generally, right? And we have we're the 12th largest court system. We have um, one of the lowest incarceration rates. I support that, but it has to be balanced against issues of safety, of physical safety. All right, Chris. Um, <clears throat> what do you think uh, 20 years down the road uh, our justice system would kind of look like? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the things, and as a younger judge, I'm not that young, so, uh, but I'm, I'm a younger judge that I'm excited for is taking advantage of a lot of the social science and the research that's out there. Um, I hope there are a lot of improvements in neurology vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, I'm just talking about criminal stuff, setting aside civil stuff, that, that we can understand human behavior a little bit better in 20 years um, so that we can tailor uh, sentences uh, a little bit better. I think the impulse in this community to reduce incarceration is, and across the nation in a lot of places is right, but we have to make sure we know what that means and, and how that, and without the science, um, you know, without studies on restorative justice, you know, we, we don't know. And uh, I think as a younger judge, I'm eager to learn that stuff. And, uh, and maybe not three months in, but maybe three years in, maybe 10 years in, you know, or else I'll be relatively young for a judge. Um, I'll be able to lead some of those discussions. Part of that, not making law, not making policy, but being the resource. Okay, time for another question or two, David. Seattle prosecutors are seeking to vacate more than 540 convictions against people caught carrying small amounts of pot before legalization. Do you believe this policy should be expanded? Um, first of all, again, I think um, I'm going to be very, I'm going to be cautious on these types. Of, these are good questions, <laughs> no doubt. And I wish, if I weren't. A judicial officer, if we were, and we were buddies, you know, and it was over a drink, I would have all sorts of thoughts I could share. But in these kinds of settings, in in my capacity as a judicial officer, I have to be very careful about what I say and what I don't say. I, you, I know you get that. Um, the law has been wrong in a lot of ways over the years. We talked about Plessy v. Ferguson. There's no two ways around it. We get things wrong. We're humans, and we in this issue are humans, and and we need to correct those things. I think I'm totally supportive of identifying laws uh, that uh, are wrong and whether that's through the legislature or whether that's through a ballot complaint that comes or resolution before court, there are ways of, of dealing with those wrong laws. And the most important thing is though, to have a process. Part of that process is to have a neutral arbiter. And that's what I want to be, a neutral arbiter. I'm just wondering if um, uh, you're you said you were recently appointed, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it seems that most of the judicial candidates we interview through the years, yeah. I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it seems, yeah. uh, um, start as appointed yeah. and then run for election, uh, uh, which of course makes me worry about what happens when we have the wrong governor, right, right yeah. uh, appointing them. Yeah. I just want your thoughts are about uh, the, uh, yeah. The elective process yeah, for yeah. judges. I mean, it's a super good question. Again, we can talk about it forever. Um, you know, there is no point number one. I think there's no silver bullet here. You know, I mean, pure appointments in state systems don't always generate good decisions either. Um, they can be overly politicized. Um, there are other models like in Arizona where you don't you don't have a challenger. Like I don't have a challenger right now, but I might get one. Um, uh, but in Arizona, you just stand for retention. It's your name up or down, um, and that has some benefits. Uh, you know, obviously the federal system, when I was nominated by President Obama, that would have been a lifetime appointment. There are benefits, pros and cons there. I think overall elections are a good thing for the state system. Um, there are a lot of judges, and it's hard to ensure the quality of it. And elections provide some accountability for judges. Um, you know, there are 53 judges on my, uh, it's not bad for, you know, a couple of them to be challenged every once in a while. And to keep them on their toes and to make sure that they're treating people respectfully. Because federal judges, you know, a lot of federal judge friends, and they, you know, you get up there, lifetime appointment, you don't have to treat everybody great all the time. So, pros and cons, lots of issues, um, but it's a really good question, I think. 
All right, we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Yeah. Um, first of all, again, thanks so much. It's beautiful outside. You guys are in this conference room uh, and doing something really important, I think, uh, which is representing uh, your guys' district. Um, one thing I guess we didn't talk about is how much I really like this job. Like, I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't be, and I've only been in this for three months, but I'm really enjoying it. I love jurors. I've had almost eight jury trials already, and I just love folks who may be like you who call in one day and be jurors. I love the variety of the job. And I just like helping people. I mean, people say judges make decisions all the time, but really I try to help people reach resolution most of the time without me having to make a decision. That's not the cop out, but that's because I think a little bit better communication facilitated by the judge would be good. Yeah. So I hope you guys, uh, with your endorsement, I'll be able to retain my job a little bit longer. So. Great. I brought, I brought cards. It has my website on it. I'll just leave it here. Perfect. Thank you. We can pass. Thank you. Okay. Good.